welcome everybody. Um, good morning, and I'm, I'm uh, glad to be here again this morning with you to spend the next couple of hours to wrap up the RSA um, program. So you should be able to see my screen right now, and it should have the word out there conducting RSAs. So if anybody doesn't see that, please, please let me know. Yeah, I'm not seeing your screen right now. Okay, so let's it's just coming up. <laughs> let's see if it'll is. come up here. That might have been me, so I apologize. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. So, okay, so you should be seeing my screen now. So anyway, so back down at the farm here, um, yesterday we laid the foundation of what an RSA is and how we want to apply it and manage the process. So it was kind of more of the mundane, kind of boring thing. It was just kind of getting things set up, perhaps development of a policy, the importance of having a good leader who's very knowledgeable in RSAs, and especially if you're gonna do some kind of a pilot project to begin with to be able to successfully walk through this process. So today, we're gonna to get down to it. Here's the, where the rubber meets the road, the nitty gritty. Um, the following slides will outline the steps for conducting an RSA. And it's important to note as we go through this that you shouldn't skip any of these steps because if you do skip some of these steps, then you really don't have a, a valid or structured formal uh, roadway safety audit. Um, so you can almost kind of think about it a, a little bit like baking a cake. So let's go ahead and get our big mixing bowl out and our spoon and dump the ingredients in and stir it around and see what we come up with. So it really is kind of a bit of a step-by-step -step process. Um, you know, and so I want to start with, again, at the beginning of the Yellow Brick Road, step one. And the objective of step one is to identify the project and the existing road. And this is to identify the project or existing road to be audited. We want to keep in mind that, that, that comes in, RSAs can kind of come in two flavors. You can have a road safety audit that will speak to your design. So if you're having a project that is under design, you can drop a roadway safety audit process and probably at that preliminary design stage is probably about the best point to do that. If you do have a, an RSA that you want to do on an existing road, so you're really not talking about dropping an RSA into a design process, you can go out to your existing road or intersection and audit that. And we'll see that as, as our day unfolds here today. So the whole objective is to identify the project or existing road to be audited and set the RSA parameters. Uh, one of the best ways to identify your roadway is the data. And we talked pretty extensively about data and data gathering, if for those of you who joined me with the intersection safety workshop and how we can go out there and uh, through the a really neat program that LTAC has, you can go and zoom into sections of roadway, you can zoom into uh, intersections of roadway, and you can see what's going on as far as the historical data goes, as far as crash data. You can also find out what the geometric elements are of the roadway and so on, and this kind of helps you then identify those roadways that you want to focus in on. Um, it's important to adhere to a predetermined policy when you're selecting a project, so we talked a little bit yesterday about trying to come up with a, with a policy that uh, speaks to how you would, how you would uh, manage your RSA program and it eliminates kind of questions and concerns. So if you do have a policy, it's a good idea then to roll that out and, and speak to it. So the parameters should be defined as the following. We want to know what the scope is. In other words, we're going to draw a box around this and, and define what is our work task or a scope that's going to be uh, taking place. It's very important what the schedule is. We, we all work in a, in a scheduled, structured world. We just can't dawdle along. So when we drop the RSA appropriately into the process, we want to be able to put a schedule. We're going to begin the RSA here, and then we're going to end the RSA here. So everybody kind of knows what's going on. We want to talk about team requirements. And again, I, I focused yesterday, and you're going to hear me say it again, and over that the fab three is very very important to be on your team and then you can branch out with that so again the fab three for the people who know the roadway the best and can really contribute a lot of great information as to what they observe what they see the historical aspects of the roadway or intersection and that is those who operate and maintain the highway maintenance in my view those are the most important uh, secondly is law enforcement because they live and breathe the roadway they see all the bad things that happen from a safety standpoint. And the third member of FAB3 is EMS because they deal with the aftermath. And you'd be surprised if they have a lot of a lot of information to offer as well. And then you can branch the team out from there depending upon your needs. You might need a traffic operations person, you might need a design engineering person, 
If you're doing a project in an urban area in a business district, maybe a representative from the business association, they might have some ideas on improving safety as well. So then the next thing we want to outline as our parameters is uh, the audit tasks, who's gonna do what, and we're gonna cover that as, we, as our day unfolds. We wanna talk just a little bit about what the formal audit report contents and format, what that looks like, because we are gonna write a formal report. Remember, this is a formal process, so there'll be a report going out from the RSA team. And we'll also wanna talk just a little bit about what that response report looks like and what the expectations are from the owner. And it's always, always good to keep in mind that the RSA team remains as an independent unit and, and functions independently. And there's a lot of merit to that because it, it's almost like, hey, you don't have to listen to, you know, in-house people who may be telling you the same thing over and over. You've got a really independent team coming in and give, give to give this uh, safety problem or the safety issues a fresh set of eyes. And sometimes when it comes down to implementing and initiating a project, sometimes the decision makers, they really appreciate having that fresh perspective. And sometimes it really kind of tips the balance as to whether we're going to do a project or not. So step one again was to identify the project. We'll do that through data and we'll set forth our tasks of scope, team requirements, audit tasks, report expectations, and so on. So we move on then to the next step. And this is a very important step and it needs, there needs to be a lot of thought kind of given to how we select the team. So the whole objective of selecting the audit team is to choose an independent, qualified, let's underline, underline that word, qualified, and multidisciplinary team of experts who can conduct the RSA successfully. Um, so the selecting of the RSA team is important and this must be given some pretty good thought. Um, the project owner is typically responsible for selecting the roadway safety audit team leader. And then together, they will sit down and put together the RSA team. So the project owner and the RSA team leader need to select a group of qualified individuals with individuals coming from within their agency, but also take a look at using somebody outside your agency. Maybe there's somebody in an adjacent highway district that can come in and look at a problem with a fresh set of eyes and give, give fresh perspective. So regardless of where you find the team members, the audit team again must be independent of the project being audited. So the project owner and RSA team leader should also ensure that the audit team represents the group of individuals that combines possesses the set of skills that's gonna ensure that the most critical aspects of your safety program or your, or your safety challenge is going, to be, um, is going to be addressed and is going to be met. So there needs to be a lot of, lot of thought put together as to who is on the team. And obviously um, individuals need to be able to communicate well and they also need to be able to, to uh, get along in a team environment. Doesn't mean that they can't have differing opinions and so on, but you know, also members who respect each other's opinions and, and work together well in that team environment. So again, the RSA uh, uh, owner selects the team leader. So in addition, individuals representing other areas of specialty may be considered depending upon the type of project. Um, they can represent maintenance, enforcement, first responders, again, the fab three that I believe should always be part of an RSA. Uh, areas of specialty that would further supplement the core skills depends on the RSA and what phase you're doing. If you're doing an RSA that's in a pre-construction phase, so it's a project that's being designed, you may need some design people that can help explain the design or can understand the design process. Uh, during construction, you may need to have some construction people that can help, help determine or help uh, explain, again, the construction process and in post-construction, those individuals who operate and maintain the highway. So again, the FAB 3 should, again, always be uh, present, and I can't overemphasize that independence needs to be maintained. So here are some of the things maybe to consider with the team background. Um, in the pre-construction phase, projects that are under, under design, Members must rely upon drawings to determine what the project will entail. You know, they need to be able to visualize the road in three dimensions with all its various appurtenances, roadside design features, and so on, and be able to kind of explain it to the team in, in a clear format so the team understands what the project may look like. Um, 
A field investigation of the site of the proposed road will help in visualizing the design and assist the audit team in better understanding how the new project will transition into becoming a new roadway. And this is where it's a little bit tricky, you know. So if you're if you're dumping in, and you're working on a design, and you just really kind of have a bare piece of ground, you have to be able to have a team that can kind of visualize what the roadway is going to look like and can focus in on some of the safety challenges that the design might be producing. So it can be a bit of a bit of a of a trick. So in the preliminary design stage, which is probably the best stage to drop in your RSA process. You should, maybe should have a road design engineer skilled in horizontal and vertical alignment who's able to talk about cross-sectional elements and uh, how intersections are laid out. So again, it'll have to be somebody who can really kind of clearly seize the design work and be able to help the other members understand what's going on. Um, if you're doing an RSA in the final design stage, you're starting to get a little bit late on doing the RSA. That's okay, because some of the things you discover with the roadway safety audit might cause you to change some of the designs and back up the design team to, to make those changes. But certainly if you're doing something in the final design stage, you might need a traffic operations engineer, or somebody that's really skilled in traffic to kind of help you do that as well. In the construction phase, um, the audit team should have people uh, that have a specialty, perhaps in some human factors. And what I mean by human factors, I mean, when we look at human factors, we look at how the user of the roadway perceives what is going on with the roadway. In other words, how does the roadway speak to me? Uh, there's such thing as sign, I think we'll all agree there's such thing as sign pollution. You'll go out there and there's a lot of people who believe that a sign will cure all your ills where it does not you create a lot of confusion for drivers. And so somebody that is in human factors as far as being able to address that, as far as what the road user can digest, they can only digest so much information going down the road at 50 or 60 miles an hour. It might be how uh, a road user can, can uh, digest, you know, gaps in traffic for making a safe turning movement and those types of things. So human factors kind of does play a, a bit of a role. And this is something that's always been kind of missing in that traditional um, safety review. Certainly, certainly law enforcement and EMS again, and maintenance rounds out the, uh, at the team. And so there might be other people that, that come on the team as well. So the RSA team leader is typically the primary point of contact. You really want to establish a pretty good communications uh, schedule so you don't get a lot of like this. I've seen that happen where people are talking to other people and it gets really confusing as to who's doing what who's on first base. So it's really important to kind of establish a bit of a, of a, a, a communications protocol. So the RSA leader or the team leader, if you're going out and looking for an individual, here's what I believe some of the attributes of this individual need to be in order to be successful. They really need to have a great, really good understanding or an in-depth understanding of the RSA process and be willing to have the heart of a teacher to kind of help start teaching an agency how to do this so they can take that over. Um, uh, so if you write a scope of work and you're going to have somebody come in from the outside to be a leader, I would strongly suggest that you put in that scope of work that they have a duty to do teaching functions, that they just don't swoop in and do the RSA and swoop out without leaving behind some, some knowledge of that process and being able to teach your champion or, or teach others uh, what this process is all about. They need to have excellent communication skills. You're gonna put a team together that's internal, but also you're gonna to have to communicate with design teams if your project's being designed, and you're gonna to have to be able to, to communicate with, with other leaders, uh, not only within the agency, but also potentially outside the agency as, as well. Uh, that was some report writing. Everybody's gonna have an opportunity to write the report. We'll go over that in a little bit here but your leader needs to have some excellent writing skills and be able to communicate through the written word and then have some leadership skills and to be able, you know, every once in a while, you might have minor debates, minor uh, points of view. You need somebody who can be able to work through that, let everybody have their point of view, but in the end, in sunsets in the West, we all are on the same team and we have to resolve any conflicts that uh, come along. This last one I think is very important, the size of the RST, RSA team and it should not be extraordinarily large. Um, 
three is probably too few. Certainly uh, 15, 18, 20 is probably too big. I like to think, and, and my experience has shown that if you have a team that has about eight, seven, eight, nine, 10, maybe 11 members representing your various disciplines or functions, that's a pretty good size. That's just about a right size because it's a real manageable group and you're able to, to, to work together real well and you're able to move the process down the field. If you get, I saw an RSA once there, somebody tried to do it with like 25 people and it just turned into a, a train wreck because it's just, it, it became very unmanageable and you know, they wanted to build the horse but ended up building, building the camel as the old adage goes. So be mindful of the, of the size of the team. You certainly want to capture everybody and get the expertise you want on the team, but you don't want it so large that it becomes unmanageable. So here we go. Here's a challenge question. Okay. So Welcome back, everybody. So we'd like um, you guys to go through your groups and go ahead and speak on some of the things that you guys came up with. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, our group came up with a few things. Uh, one of them was that it can be politicized so that if you have um, elected officials, they may or may not be okay with who the team leader is, or they may have somebody in mind, but that's not the most appropriate person. Um, in smaller agencies, you may hire someone that, um, is like a design professional and they won't include everybody that needs to be included. And Brent kind of touched upon this, you know, they just kind of do their thing and leave. Um, also in a smaller agency, you might have somebody that just doesn't know kind of what they're doing and um, may not even ask for help. Um, and what else did we come up with, Lori? <laughs> well, the last one, I think you meant, I think you hit all of them except, and there was time to do. To do oh yeah, things. time. Like um, somebody might get voluntold and then they just don't have the time and they don't have the buy-in and they just kind of uh, dial it in. I think, I think you got all of it. Thanks, Shannon. Well, I'll go for our group. We just kind of come up with like lack of manpower, you know, smaller agencies, you know, guys not having or having too much on their plate already to try to take on that kind of responsibility. Talk about, you know, maybe like hiring outside sources and, uh, you know, finding people that are actually qualified to do that. And uh, maybe you guys not really wanting to carry that responsibility if stuff doesn't go right. About what we talked about. Okay, I guess I'll go because Brian doesn't want to. Um, <laughs> um, so we talked about several of the same things that were previously discussed. Um, one issue that wasn't really brought up is some of the smaller um, jurisdictions, the, the money that it would take to hire outside the organization would be um, something that would be a drawback. And uh, but I think everything else was pretty much covered in the other discussions. Brian, is there anything I missed? Good job, Tanya. <laughs> Can we hear from another group? Okay, okay. I'll <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was wondering if, uh, and lots of what we talked about have already been, has already been mentioned, but I was wondering, and I was drawing about from my own experience in past years, I was asked to serve on different committees for different reasons as a citizen representative. And I know we're looking for a leader, but uh, I'm thinking that possibly somebody from outside the organization that's that's not used to either the culture or politics that might draw things out, might help to speed things up. Um, and then you can always blame the commission if it's, if it's a failure. <laughs> <laughs> guys from Grangeville know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. 
I don't have much else to say. Thank you. Did, did we have one more group? Okay, well, uh, we'll turn it back over to Brent. Hey, yeah, I, um, I appreciate those comments and I, I really kind of like the comments that kind of keying in on the comment about the uh, one about, you know, being politicized. And again, when you get in, when you get into safety and, and safety issues, just depending on, you know, if you're in an urban setting or a rural setting, you can get into that. And we talked a little bit about that during the intersection safety workshop. And again, just, just a real, real quick story. I know time is, is of the essence here, but you know, when I was in Eastern Idaho, I was approached by a legislator and there was a, a nasty crash that happened with this individual's far distant relative. Um, there was the demand for a signal but yet when we looked at the data and we went back and looked at the crash history, there really wasn't a problem. It was just kind of an outlier that took place. And so we had to have a discussion as to where we invest the money for the most, most good. And so once we started looking at the data and where the data was taking us, uh, we, were, we were then successful. I was successful in convincing this individual that our, our money might be well spent uh, uh, putting it in other areas. However, it did lend itself to a roadway safety audit because we bear in mind that those are bought expensive. When you compare roadway safety audits to the grand scheme of the world and, and your infrastructure programs and so on, they're really not that expensive. So we went through that process and we were able to actually do some, some low cost upgrades as far as changing some striping and, and some signage and pavement markings. And that really helped the situation as well. So I think that that is, that is really well taken. The other, the thing I would comment to is on is, you know, having someone from the outside come in does tend to maybe draw out where people, you know, because there has to be some freedom there to where people are going to come up and really kind of express their views or express what they're seeing. And sometimes it's a, it, you just have to kind of have a, a, a that inside uh, introspection that, you know, this is something that maybe we're, maybe we're going to be talking about people things that people may not like to hear, but yet we need to address safety to start saving lives. And then finally, it's just, yeah, having the, having the time to do that and then the, the, the funding and resources. And I'm going to talk about funding for roadway safety audit towards the end of today and where there may be some funding sources available. So all really good, all really good comments. Uh, really appreciate that. So let's go ahead and we'll advance to the next slide here. Okay. Go ahead so, and share your, share your screen, Brent. Okay, very good. Let me um, let me see if I can't do that real quick. Like, there we go. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. There we go. Okay. There we go. So we're going to back up one here. Okay. So we've uh, we've identified the project in the first step, and again, I would strongly suggest that you really take a look at the data when you're drilling down into these projects that you're trying to identify, especially if you're going to do a roadway safety audit on an existing roadway or an existing intersection. Take a look at where the, where the data can take you. We went through quite a little process in our, in our last workshop on what that might look like. Um, and then we've also then selected the team. So the next thing we want to do is put together the pre-audit meeting. And this is where, the, again, the leader is going to step up to the table. The whole objective of the pre-audit meeting is to set the context of the RSA by bringing together the project owner comes in. If you're doing the, an RSA during a design, you're gonna to have to have the design team sit at the table. The audit team comes to the table as well and to discuss the scope and review all the available information. And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. It's the RSA leader that, that typically leads this pre-audit meeting and you're bringing in all the information and you're gonna spend some time together in a room, a conference room with large tables and roll everything out and start going through all the information that you've got. Uh, history, uh, traffic, traffic volumes, crash, crash reporting. If you're doing the design, what the design looks like. If you're doing an existing roadway, what are the elements of the roadway? Uh, are the elements good elements, poor elements? You just kind of lay it all out on the table and you go down through the process. And so the, the leader, the good leader, has to do a little bit of homework ahead of time to put together an agenda and guide the, guide the process. But the audit meeting basically is to hand over all of that relevant information. Maps, charts, pictures, transportation plans, 
any agency safety policies or standards, traffic counts. It's just you lay it out all on the table and you start sifting through it because everybody then starts getting acclimated. They start thinking about what are the important issues that we really need to kind of start focusing in, not, not only as a team, but also as individuals. So prior to the audit, um, they were responsible to lay all of this out and make sure that the team, team understands all of this. So taking it just a little bit step further, um, during the pre-audit meeting, we also, we do review the scope of the project and the overall objectives of the RSA. So everybody sitting at the table understands the scope and the objectives. The owner, if your project's being designed, the design team and certainly the RSA. We delegate responsibilities. As we kind of delve into this, there are gonna be issues of maybe law enforcement that come up. So we want our law enforcement person to be uh, available to help discuss that or lead some of those discussions. Some EMS, some maintenance issues, what's been taking place in the past, what's being observed in the field, some of the challenges there, and anybody else that you might have, have on the team. Uh, the leader starts delegating some responsibility and putting people on notice that, that we're gonna depend upon them to, to lend their expertise. Uh, we agree upon a schedule for the RSA completion. Most RSAs, it's been my experience, that if they, they start and work all the way through the process, typically are about a week. That's from beginning to end. It just depends on the complexity and the size of the project. Sometimes they'll take a little bit longer. Sometimes they'll just be a little bit shorter. It just depends on how complex you are. Sometimes the team might say, okay, we're gonna take the RSA up through, let's say the field review, kind of take a breather for a week and we'll come back a week later and then start doing the report writing. So they might break it up a little bit. And so there's a lot of different ways to put the schedule together. But the important thing is, is that you do have a schedule that everybody understands what the timeline is and you move the ball down the trail. The worst thing you can do is let the wheels fall off the cart and everybody, everybody loses track of the project. And if that happens, your leader probably is not doing, doing their job. Uh, another thing to be able to, we touched upon a little earlier, is to set up the good lines of communication during this meeting because there are going to be a lot of, lot of things flying around the room uh, after the pre-audit meeting. And so we want to make sure that we understand what that good communication looked like so we don't get confused because that communication matters uh, to the importance of the audit team. So in summary, the pre-audit meeting is to hand over all the relevant information to the audit team, review the scope and objectives, delegate some responsibilities, set up the communication, and communicate matters of importance to the entire RSA team. Um, so the agenda, I wanna to touch upon this just kind of real briefly. Uh, the agenda is gonna look a little bit different depending upon when you're dropping in your RSA process. And if your RSA is coming at you during the pre-construction phase of a project, Typically, again, the, the project is being designed. And so the big trick is, is to when do we interject the RSA process seamlessly so we don't mess up the project schedule, project development schedule. And I would submit to you that the best time to come in with an RSA is probably right in the early to mid point of preliminary design. Uh, you've gotten past the planning stage. You're now putting stuff down on paper. The designers are, are working. You might get to about the 30% design point and individuals are gonna be able to, the team is gonna be able to look at it and understand what the project is all about. If you drop in during the final design review, those safety issues that are uncovered might cause changes to be made to the design and you might find yourself backing up the, the, the project schedule for the design team. And design teams typically don't like to back up the train and I don't blame them. I've, I've lived that before in a former life. And you know, backing up the train is, is typically no fun, especially if you're doing the project, if you're designing the project in-house, backing up the train is a little easier. If you're having a consultant do the project, especially if it's a larger project, backing up the train, the consultant is probably gonna to wanna to talk to you about a change order and it might cost you a little bit of money to back up that train. So think about that, uh, think about the timing. Uh, if you're gonna do an RSA during construction, and I don't see very many RSAs that are actually done during the construction phase, there have been some RSAs that have been done on, on really complex work zones and just focusing in on the work zone for safety. 
and that has paid some dividends and might help with liability situation. I mentioned yesterday, I also do expert witness work and was involved in quite a lawsuit with the local agency. Uh, the local agency won, there was a jury trial, but uh, I think what helped them is that they did have some good planning ahead of time. Certainly if you're doing the RSA during the construction of the project or if you're doing it free opening of the road or intersection after it's all built, you're clearly really kind of getting into the process real late in the game. And if you're gonna make changes, those changes might come at you with a, with a price tag. Again, uh, if you're doing an RSA in the post-construction on existing roadways or existing intersections, uh, you can drop those in at any time. You don't have to be on some kind of a design schedule, but you do have to be around a schedule to be able to, to move the project down the field. And then for land development RSAs, the, the project owner is going to need to provide some land use planning along with planning and zoning development criteria. This type of RSA is more unique and the criteria is usually developed on a case by case basis. And I don't see a lot of RSAs that are being done in the land development arena. However, if you've got some large developments, especially commercial ones where you're introducing a, a different, a whole totally different mix of traffic and commercial traffic, and you're going to be uh, negotiating deals with, with developers to provide some, uh, some roadway design, additional roadway design features such as turn lanes, deceleration lanes, acceleration lanes, and so on. An RSA to roll in that safety element uh, might be a benefit um, because then you're going to capture those safety elements when the project is, is, is uh, being built. Um, if you come back later and do it, then, then typically the agency may be paying for those rather than being a shared cost or a cost from, from the developer. So everyone is different. And those tend to be kind of customized and on a case by case basis. So the pre audit meeting kind of, de, kind of determines all of that. So now we're getting down to it. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Okay, and actually this is kind of the fun part. Um, we're going to go and do a perform a review and do, do the field review. We've selected the project, hopefully in a data driven environment. We've selected a really super team, okay? Um, we've gone through all the pre-audit information that we've acclimated ourselves to the project. Now we're ready to go conduct the review. So the whole objective of conducting a project uh, review, data review, is to gain insight into the project or existing road and to prepare for the field visit and to actually do the field visit. And so we identify those preliminary areas of safety concern and some of those things we're gonna focus on as we do the field review. So the RSA team by now examines the design drawings and details. They start imagining how the project is going to appear from the perspective of road users. Again, if you're doing the RSA during, during the design of a project, and this includes drivers of different vehicle types, you know, commercial vehicles, maybe walk the shoes of, of, of older, vehicle, older drivers. And also don't forget other road users when you start when we start looking at field reviews, such as cyclists and pedestrians, including pedestrians with different, different uh, age groups or, or abilities. So a useful approach is to review the design projects and the design drawing systematically in one direction at a time for each road section and to identify each movement individually through the intersections. So you're gonna go out there, put your boots on and start tromping, tromping the earth. And that's, to me, that's the fun part. So the field review is a key task that the RSA team should undertake on all audits. Even if you're doing an audit in preliminary design or even in a planning stage, some audits have been performed where there's nothing more than stakes on the ground in a, in a bare field. It gets a little hard to, uh, uh, it gets a little hard to kind of visualize what the road is gonna look like. You're starting to look at planning documents and, and, and preliminary design documents. And that's why maybe somebody that's on your team really kind of understands that engineering aspect and kind of plainly in everyday language to discuss and talk with the rest of the team as to what it, what it looks like. But at any rate, the field review needs to be done. You cannot skip this step, it's very important. So the safety of the RST, RSA team and all road users during the field review is key consideration. What I mean by that is don't get out there and get run over. Um, sometimes people, um, kind of won't think about safety and they go prancing around live traffic and, and especially if you've got some team members and believe it or not you will have a few team members that's not really used to um, live traffic you know you take law enforcement certainly the operators and main, 
maintainers, maintenance of the highway individuals and EMS, they kind of understand what live traffic is all about. But you will get people who will wander around and believe that traffic's going to stop for them where it doesn't. So you want to be able to be, be safe out there. So do conduct the field review, no matter what type. The issues identified in the review of the project data should be verified in the field. So when you went through your pre-audit meeting in step three, you're going to start focusing in on those safety things that you think you would want to address, but you want to start now verifying those in the field. Uh, photos are great. Take lots of photos. But remember, always label your photos, date stamp them, put a brief description as to what you were seeing. I've seen it where RSAs are performed and they come back and they start looking at photos and writing this and people ask the question, where was this photo taken? And the answer is, uh, I don't know. And so it becomes, you know, the real can become kind of a nightmare and that work is, is uh, done for naught. So be sure when you're doing video and photos that you really date stamp them and have a description as to what the photo is, is, is all about. Um, so they should be taken of anything that may need to be reviewed or revisited while writing the RSA report or while presenting the RSA findings to the project owner. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So again, be sure and identify your pictures. Um, some of the things to, to look at um, when you do the field review is do the field review, especially if you're doing a field review with uh, an existing roadway or an existing intersection. Look at it at various times. Do a night review. You'll, you'll find that there are amazing things from a safety standpoint that you won't uncover during the daytime review. Uh, consider taking the observation of rush hour and rush hour traffic and what that might look like. So you might be scheduling a couple of different times that you're going to go out into the field. Look at those main commute times, those commuter patterns, and also look at those human behavior observations. You know, what is the roadway, especially if you're doing an RSA on the existing roadway or intersection, what is it telling the driver? What is the signage telling the driver? Conveying a clear message, or is it being, or is it, is it confusing to roadway drivers? So those are some of the things that they need to consider, and I certainly advocate doing a, doing a, a nighttime visit as well. So one approach um, to field reviews, and I personally like this and personally would do this one or do this one, is that um, team members go out and look at the site from an independent nature. In other words, there's no group think, there's no group tour. Everybody is independent and they get to go around the project and look at the things that they believe are of a concern and those things that kind of popped forward during the pre-audit meetings. And the reason I say that is because we're all human beings. We all kind of focus together. Every so often you might get somebody who is going to be like group think leader and is going to kind of take charge and kind of maybe try to persuade others. Uh, uh, and you want to really be, stay away from that, especially from the independence part of things. So I always advocate, and when I do field reviews, I say, we're going to go out individually, take good notes, good photos, take the time that you need to take, be safe, but look at it independently. And then we'll come back, usually take a break, come back, and then we'll look at it from a group standpoint. And what I find is when we do it that way, we're able to really start a, a discussion amongst the group. You know, I saw this, I found that. And you look for those common threads and that commonality, but you also are keying in on those issues that somebody might have seen that really didn't occur to anybody else. If you didn't have that individual uh, individualization to begin with, you might lose some of that independence and that independent thinking. So I always advocate, you know, go out as individuals and come back as a group. Again, take good photos and make good detailed notes. And it, it kind of gets you away from that potential of, of uh, group things. So here we go, another chat room. Let's get back into our groups. And we want to discuss this question. What other approach or information would you gather during the field review as part of the RSA team? And just kind of think about that. Think about a, a section of roadway that you believe has safety issues or an intersection. Are there things that leap out at you? You know, what information would you want to gather and what approach might you want to take? I've kind of outlined one approach, maybe there's some other approaches. Okay, guys, we're going to send you back out to your groups.
join the larger group, we'll probably just go through and ask each group to speak in the same order they did the last time. That way we just know. Who's okay, so our group, we switched speakers. Um, we thought that it'd be a good idea to look at the behavior at the intersection and how um, pedestrians are using it and bicyclists as well as traffic if they're stopping or whatnot. Um, also, if we could collect data beforehand and look at the counts and see what kind of information we can go into the project or the audit with. Um, the weather and the time of the year, it might be good to keep an eye on that intersection or the project area throughout the year. Also, the drainage um, in the springtime, you know, if everything is draining properly. The vegetation, it might be a little more extreme in different parts of the year. Um, and I think, I think that's all. All right, yeah. Thanks, Savannah. Yeah, well, Savannah pretty much covered a lot um, on what we had too, you know, the safety concerns, you know, especially with uh, pedestrian crossings, bike crossings, you know, ADA ramps with blind spots and stuff like that. A big one up here we have, you know, our weather conditions in the, in the winter, you know, like where do you put your snow? you know, that would not cause blind spots, you know, stacking it up on the sides. Another good one we thought, you know, for like commercial vehicles, you know, making your wide turns and stuff, trying to get back onto the roadways, you know, hauling the trailers and, and stuff like that. So that's about uh, everything our group came up with. Thanks, Jason. So those were a lot of good points. We came up with um, several of the same um, site distance obstructions such as new structures that may have been built. Um, Brian came up with a good one that when you're walking the site to maybe walk it from the viewpoint of the different users. So if there are a lot of, a lot of bikers out there, maybe ride your bike on it or um, walk it instead of just driving it. Um, look at the different lighting. So look at it at day and night. Um, take into consideration whether it's a wilderness area and there might be animals crossing the road. Um, the actual road conditions of the road itself, whether it needs um, what type of maintenance. And then we also went over the possible um, flooding issues, water on the roadway at different times. So I think that's about it. Thanks, Tanya. Any other group? For our group, uh, the other three named most of our bullet points. Um, I guess high volume roads, like different times a day. We got some roads out here that during the day there's traffic nonstop and then in the evening it kind of shuts down. And then maybe look at like crash data for that, that section beforehand, like Savannah said, kind of get a heads up of what's been going on on that road. And then everybody covering everything else that we talked about. Thanks, Kyle. I think it was at all the groups. Okay. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay, very good. We'll do that. It's time to share. We did have a question in the chat box, Brent. Um, do you have any recommendations on the data that an agency should collect prior to an RSA that would be helpful for the process? Yeah. His answer is no. <laughs> Did the say Brent freeze on us? Might have not seen his screen. We lost him. There he is. Oh, okay. There, 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 there he is. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying is LTAC has a great tool out there and we and we used it. We looked at it when we were in the uh, intersection safety workshop 
where you can go out and look at uh, crash data going back, uh, then the magic number is typically about five years to go back and look at that. And one of the things too that you might want to look at with data is, yes, the, the crash data is out there and the reportable data, but you also want to have an opportunity to discuss or try to get a handle on what is the, I'm going to call it near miss data. You know, the stuff that maybe goes unreported, but we know that's happening out there. And many times law enforcement um, may have a handle on that because they're out there seeing it all the time. They even might write tickets for people that are exhibiting, say, poor behavior or poor driving habits or, you know, something tied back to how that roadway or intersection is functioning. So I, I think that, and that's a great question, I think that when you get into the pre-audit setting, when you've got the owner there and, you, and if you're doing a design, you've got the design team there, to, that should be one of the things on your agenda is to put together that data list. I hope that has answered your question because there's some stuff out there that's readily available and it's canned, but then there's also some other stuff out there that you might be interested in that you might have to go do a little bit of digging on, so. Okay. Alrighty, so let's go ahead. I think, uh, do I have my screen shared? Not yet. Okay, so let's go back to sharing our screen. Okay, there we are. Everybody see it? Yes. Okay. So anyway, let's just go ahead and, and kind of go over one more slide. So step four, so again, we've identified the project. Um, we've talked about selecting the team. We've done a pre-audit meeting. We've actually now gone out there and done the in-depth field review. Took lots of great notes, took lots of great pictures, uh, had a real nice opportunity to look at the project as individuals and then chat as a group. We're now gonna come back in and look at the audit and start doing an analysis of our findings. So the objective is conducting this RSA analysis is starting to prepare the report that succinctly reports the findings of the audit and the findings of the audit team through the identification and prioritization of safety issues. So we're gonna start thinking about the list we're gonna to put together. We're also gonna start thinking about prioritization. Um, and we're gonna get into that in just a little bit when we start into the report writing. So suggestions then should be made for you know, reducing the degree of risk. And again, I'm gonna have a little conversation on how risk is important to dial into this process. And our idea is to look at ways to demonstrate the reductions of risk. But um, speaking of, of uh, prioritization and risk, uh, at the risk of, of sitting too long, let's go ahead and take a little break. We've been at it now for an hour. So let's go ahead and just take five minutes. Okay, great. Okay, let's go ahead and, and get started again. So again, we've done our field review. We're now coming back in and we're gonna go through the analysis of what we've found out. So during the field review, the RSA team probably is identifying, we're hope, hoping anyway, a number of safety issues. So next the team needs to sit down and start finalizing what was found in the field and develop suggestions. So when considering the audit suggestions and in the report that you're going to write, the team may want to give the design team and the project owner guidance on the level of risk associated with your findings. So in other words, we found this with this one safety issue, here's what we believe that level of risk might be. And if you implement some fixes to this safety issue, this is the level of risk that you might be addressing that maybe is going to go away. Uh, so I encourage that you do have a little bit of a risk discussion in your report writing, and you don't have to go into a detailed risk analysis. As a matter of fact, you want to stay away from that. We're trying to keep this simple. So typically when we talk about risk, we'll talk about this is a low risk uh, identification or problem. This is a medium risk. This is, this is a high risk. And so we want to look at that. So each team, audit team, you know, should establish how they wish to evaluate risk. And how they want to prioritize the safety concerns. And I would suggest that you establish that during step three or the pre-audit pre uh, team meeting. So upon completion of the analysis, the, the team leader is ready to draft the RSA report. And typically the team leader will kind of start writing the report. Have you ever tried to write a report or write something as a group on a blank piece of paper? Um, it sometimes is hard to kind of lift the airplane up off the runway. So typically the leader 
might start with a bit of an outline, but then the whole team comes together and the team is going to be involved in writing the report. But typically the leader kind of gets the, gets the process started. So in some instances, the report will need to be written immediately after completion of the site visit. Uh, I advocate that. And the reason for that is because everything is fresh in people's minds. Sometimes the team might say, we're going to take a little break. We're going to kind of break for a week, go off and do other things, pay attention to other businesses. We have other things we have to do in life. We'll come back a week later and, and write and finish the report. Uh, so be a little bit cautious. You don't, want to, you don't want to put this off for too long because then people's memories start to fade and it's harder to bring people back together. Uh, and again, we have to be mindful of the schedule that, that we put ourselves on. So RSA reports are typically completed in a relatively short period of time, uh, maximum of about two weeks, two weeks or less. And the report needs to be to the point and, and concise. Uh, and you need to keep it simple. I advocate for the use of maps and photos, because as you're going to see here in just a moment when, when this report and these findings are presented, photos maps, videos, they go a long way to trying to explain to others what the safety concerns and what the safety issues are on this project. Uh, and they're very, very beneficial. So I am a very big advocate of being able to use visual aids in the report out. So, you know, the report, not one size fits all. In fact, each group kind of comes up with their own, own little different format, but uh, kind of as a, just a general guideline report needs to have some kind of an introduction and there should be like a brief description of the project including the scope and objectives keep it very simple and any special issues raised by the project owner and design team as you came together during that pre-audit uh, meeting in step three uh, talk about the stage when the rsa was conducted and that should be identified such as the planning stage if it's during design if it's uh, no design involved but you're doing an existing roadway so talk about the stage when the RSA was conducted. Uh, the design and operational elements reviewed and not reviewed should be mentioned. So if there were some elements that you did not review, you probably need to talk about those in the report and be prepared to, to address why those were not really reviewed. Um, so uh, it could be emphasized that some design elements may not be reviewed because of the stage of the RSA. You simply just didn't have enough knowledge to, to base the review on. Uh, so background information should be given, identifying the audit team members' names, uh, their affiliation qualifications, as well as the date of the pre-audit meeting and the dates and times of the field review or field reviews when they were held. So you're going to name the team and give, give credit to the team as you put together the report. So it's basically just a, just, a, uh, just a general outline with an introduction, a background, talking about the makeup of the team and their qualifications. And then also, you want to start in with your findings suggestions and the team will probably want to prioritize these in some manner and what I would suggest is that you talk about your first safety issue your top priority safety issue give a description of that issue uh, talk about risk the evaluation of the risk although I wouldn't go off the deep end on doing a big risk analysis other people will take your report and if they want to do a risk analysis they certainly are welcome to and sometimes they do do that so talk about the first safety issue, top priority, what's your next priority, safety issue two, safety issue three, and so on and so on down the line until you get to the end of your, your issues. Um, and then kind of summarize it with some kind of a formal statement, you know, concluding um, uh, statement that kind of wraps it all, all around. Uh, the whole team typically signs the report. Each member gets to put their name on this. And it is a consensus document. So the findings that are that are found in the document need to have the consensus of the team. And you have to work through that as you as you write the report. Some some things just to kind of be aware of, you know, each safety issue should be identified in the report with a brief description. However, when you issue this report, you need to be specific, but terms, you know, be a little careful. And if you've got a good leader, they should know this. The terms such as unsafe, substandard, unacceptable, deficient. You probably want to avoid those types of terms from perhaps some potential liability standpoint. You can certainly get your point across without getting into that type of terminology. So you want to be just a little bit mindful of that. So suggestions for improvement should be constructive and realistic, you know, bearing in mind the costs involved. 
And they should recognize that the project owner may have several different options to achieve the desired result. So there's different ways to perhaps skin the mule. So the RSA team leader should not demand specific corrective measures. I think that's very important. You're just laying out the issues. It will be up to the project owner and if the project is being designed to the design team to review the safety issue and determine for themselves what those good fixes might be from a detailed design standpoint if they want to implement or take you up on, on, on your suggested um, issue. So again, we covered this a bit earlier yesterday is the purpose of the RSA team is not there to design the project. They're there to identify those safety issues, put some level of risk to it. Uh, if the owner believes it has merit, then it will be up to the owner and the owner's design team to be able to, to design those fixes. And it even spills into designing fixes if you're looking at an existing intersection or an existing roadway. So we've done all that. We've done a, just a really beautiful, beautiful job of writing this report. It's concise. Don't Turn this into a 100-page report. Nobody's going to read it. It needs to be concise and short. Simple RSAs, uh, excluding pictures and videos and so on. You know, if you're like six, seven pages front and back, you've got plenty of information and plenty to talk about. So really, just keep it keep it very simple. Um, some people tend to get carried away and they'll start reading. They'll start writing war and peace and, and big documents, and you want to stay away from that because then it just gets complex and muddies the waters. Keep it simple. So in step six, we want to present the audit findings to the project owner. So the whole objective behind this is to present those audit findings to the owner and the design team, if you're dealing with the design team, and report orally the key findings of the audit as presented in the audit report. I advocate very strongly that you have an opportunity to give an oral presentation. And that serves a couple of purposes. One, uh, it, it, it's a fresh presentation and you know that everybody is paying attention or should be paying attention. This presentation may be going before say a board of commissioners, uh, other high level uh, individuals within the agency. Um, it just kind of depends on how the agency is structured. But it also gives an opportunity for a question answer session. So as this is presented, um, uh, agencies have an opportunity, those, those boards of commissioners or other, other level officials within the agency have an opportunity to ask questions. And there can be a little bit of a back and forth dialogue, which is, which is real positive. So when the oral presentation is, is given, I suggest you share some positives. Here are some things that are happening right in, in the world. Um, so do share some of those positives. I think it's a good foot to start on. Um, you may also preface the meeting with a reminder that it's the intent of the RSA to identify opportunities to improve safety rather than critique the work of the design team. So uh, again, we're not there to design the project for the designers. So if safety concerns are identified, comments can be kept as specific as possible. Uh, the issues identified should be described in terms of where they're located and how they represent a safety risk. And again, pictures and video footage shown is a really, really, really big benefit. So there's an opportunity for a little bit of informal kind of back and forth dialogue and feedback. So the big question becomes is who should present this? Who should present this report? Should it be the RSA team leader? I Everybody looks at it a little bit differently. I tend to say not necessarily. You know, there's somebody that's on the team. Again, if we go back and, and we're really trying to cultivate this process and you've identified an RSA champion within your organization, because this is something you maybe want to carry forward, it perhaps is an opportunity for that champion to make that presentation or somebody else upon the team. It doesn't necessarily have to be the leader, especially if the leader is hired from the outside or, or you're hiring some kind of consultant. I would say that it would be better off being, being brought forward and presented by another member of the team, uh, maybe somebody within that own agency. And if you have the identified RSA champion, certainly that person uh, would be a really good potential for uh, giving that report or presenting that, that report. So, there's the report. 
uh, you've given an oral presentation and then you're gonna hand over the written document and say, okay, owner, here it is. And the owner, because this is a formalized process, needs to go about the task of preparing a formal response. Again, we're not building the moon lander. We're not knowing the part down to the thousandth of an inch. It can be very, kind of very general. It can be from general to specific, but it can be very kind of informal, very simplistic, kind of to the point. So the objective of responding to the audit report is for the owner and the design team, if they're involved, is to document the response to the findings of the report. And those responses may come along the lines of, yes, this is great, yes, this is great, no, we might not agree with what you came up with, but that's okay, it's okay to agree to disagree. Okay, so it's, it, it's a response that comes back and what is sought is a letter report format signed by the project owner. And that really is a valid method of responding to the RSA report. And so the response really needs to come back in a written format. Many times it comes back in the form of a, of a memo, dear RSA team, via the RSA team leader, here's our response to, to what you found. So in responding to the RSA report, you know, the project owner and the design team have to bear in mind all the kind of competing objectives involved in the project some of which might be conflicting with safety. So they have to kind of work their way through those, those type of, of conflicts and objectives. Um, so the project owner and design team, they might consider the following in choosing whether or not to proceed with the suggestion. Is the report, RSA report finding within the scope of the project? Hopefully so. Would the suggestion made by the RSA report address the safety issue, reducing the likelihood and occurrence of a resultant severe crash? or fatality? Will the suggestion made by the RSA report lead to mobility, environmental, or other non-safety related problems? In other words, are we, if we do a suggested solution, are we creating some other problem over in some other area, like the environment or, or other types of mobility? What would be the cost associated with implementing this suggestion? Are there more cost-effective alternatives? And again, the design team may go to work and say, we want to address the safety issue, but there might be a little different angle and we can certainly get to where we need to be. And again, it's not the RSA's uh, uh, purview, it's not the RSA's uh, uh, place within their scope to do design work. So based upon the outcome, the owner and the design team may agree that a valid safety issue has been identified and they may either agree, they may disagree, or they may not choose to, even if they agree, they might not choose to implement the safety uh, issue at this time. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail just a little bit later. So the response coming back from the owner is addressing each of the safety issues that were identified by the safety team. And they're giving a response of agree, disagree, or while we do agree, we might not be able to do it at this time, but here are the reasons why. So finally, we're sliding into home plate. We get to incorporate the findings in the project when appropriate. And again, this is up to the owner to do, you know, whether you're doing a project that's under design or whether you're looking at an existing roadway or intersection. So the whole objective of this final step is to incorporate the findings into the project when appropriate and to ensure that the RSA process is a learning experience for all the parties, especially if you're getting going. If you've got a project that's uh, uh, a pilot project, we talked yesterday about trying to keep it very simple. Maybe you've, you've crafted an initial policy around how this RSA process is going to look, kind of find out how that policy worked. You know, what are the things that were working for you and what are the things that were not working for you? And so it should be viewed from an open mind standpoint and you're gonna go through a learning curve. Trust me, everybody goes through a learning curve when they introduce and do the RSA process. So again, uh, you, you use the RSA as learning. Um, so having committed to the process of RSAs, again, the, the owner and designers uh, can use this as, as a learning opportunity and decide how best to move forward with the, with the, with the process. So the owner and, and designers, when they're involved, can review the process and you know to aid in refining the future audits. And so here are some key questions that the owner, the agency owner, and if they've got the design team involved, may want to think about or ponder. So was the RSA done at the correct stage? 
like, uh oh, did we do it too late? And now we're having to spend money to back the design train up. We've talked about that. Would it have been more effective to conduct the RSA at an earlier stage where safety issues could be addressed in a more effective way, cost effective? Were the parameters established at the beginning of the RSA appropriate in meeting the desired objectives? So again, we're, we're establishing those parameters early on. Did we hit upon them? No. If we missed, how far did we miss? Did the audit team get all the data that were, they required to conduct the RSA? Maybe there just wasn't some data that was available. And so for future safety and future designs, this is data that uh, perhaps the agency should be very interested in collecting in the future. Uh, was enough time allocated for the RSA? And I heard that through some of the chat conversations was that you know being able to have the time to do this and do this appropriately could be a bit of a challenge. And so we wanna ask ourselves when we get to the finish line, did we allocate enough time to do this? Was the audit team timely in their response? Uh, hopefully that answer is yes. Uh, if the responses and the report writing dawdle on, you're gonna lose steam and it's gonna be less effective. Um, did the audit team satisfy the requirements of the RSA? That one was fairly easy to, to address, either you did or you didn't. Were the safety issues identified and suggested as made by the audit team responded to in an appropriate way in a timely fashion by the owner and the design team if the design team is involved? And is there any evidence that safety has been improved at the study location? So, so those are really good questions to kind of ask at the end. And if you're making a decision as to how best to move forward with implementing this process or, or putting this process into your, into your safety program. So I'm gonna to try to switch here. I'm gonna show you just a little handout here that could become available. Uh, let's see if we'll do this. Can you see my screen? Did it change? We're still on your slides. Okay, so let me get into share. And I need to go to this guy right here. Okay. Can you see this now? Yep, we this can see that now. Steps, steps on it. So this one I'll just leave with you. This this is available um, and or we can make this available after our after our session. This is, this is just a, a great summary of the RSA steps. Again, we're baking our cake. We've got our big mixing bowl and our mixing spoon out, dumping in all of these steps. So these are the steps that we went through, and this is probably just kind of a good summary of those steps. So I just wanted to, wanted to share that with you, and it might help you as you kind of get started in this process. Okay, should be back to my presentation? Back to your slides, yep. Okay. And we'll advance to the next one. So we talked about risk. I, I, I shared this with you when we did the intersection safety workshop for those of you who joined us for that. I like this. This is just kind of a simple matrix. When I'm trying to explain risk to somebody, not everybody kind of understands this. This might be kind of a helpful graphic. And so when we're looking at crash frequency category and the risk, and we're looking at our overall risk category, but if we look at crash frequency and we have frequent crashes, occasional, infrequent, or rare, and you can probably pick that up through, through the data, through crash reporting, through all the, that, that great data that's out there that LTAC has. And you can also pick up through the crash reporting the severity of whether you Brent, it sounds like you froze up a little bit. Like you just came in. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. We can hear you. Okay. It says your interconnection, internet connection is unstable. Well, mm. at times I'm unstable. So <laughs> we're, we're on an equal level. So. Okay. So we were talking about risk and I kind of like this matrix when I'm trying to explain to somebody about, about risk. So we have crash frequency, which you can get from crash reporting severity which you can also get from crash reporting and so a low overall rating of a corresponds for example a safety issue that the rsa team expects to generate very few or rare collisions and so as you list your prioritization this one might be lower on the list whereas a high rating of f corresponds with a safety issue that the rsa team expects to generate frequent collisions and have a potential for extreme severity such as severe injury or fatalities so it's just kind of a handy, kind of a bit of a handy dandy matrix to, to kind of help explain risk. And maybe it might help 
kind of prioritize some of your safety issues. So here we go. Let's go with another polling question. Do you believe that risk and the impacts of risk should be given consideration during an RSA? So the current poll we've got up, uh, do you believe that risk and the impacts of risk should be considered during an RSA? We're just gonna give this another minute. Don, this is Sayonara. I lost that dialogue where I can choose the option. It, it doesn't show you a... No. But my response would be yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, we're gonna share our results. Oh, 100%. <laughs> uh, you know, quite honestly, that it kind of surprises me just a little bit because sometimes when it comes to risk and having discussions of risk, people might be a little bit shy because they think they might be opening up to some some liability issues um, and that's not necessarily the case so i'm you know, on one hand i'm pleased to see 100 uh, percent you know um, but on the other hand sometimes people are a little bit reluctant to share that and, and also it shouldn't really focus the conversation focus totally on risk but risk does play a part of having that discussion so i appreciate that that information okay so let's see are we still on my slides here Okay, all right. So I want to talk just a little bit about the use of prompt lists. We're kind of to the end of our steps now, but I'm kind of giving you some, some information here that you might find useful as you go out and conduct these uh, RSAs. So prompt lists, and it's, I'll bring this up in just a moment. It's a handout. Uh, it basically just kind of generally helps guide the RSA team members to think about some of the broader issues, you know, that you're, that you're encountering, especially during the field visit. But they can also be used prior to the field visit. And they're also especially helpful when you come back and you start writing, writing your report. So I am going to see if I can bring up the prompt lists. There we go. And I do need to do a share screen. Uh, there we go, let's see. Okay, can everybody see my prompt lists? Yes. Okay. All right, so these prompt lists, and I'm not gonna go down through each and every one of these lists because number one, we'd be here for the rest of the day, and number two, you'd probably kill me. But uh, it's basically these prompt lists coincide with the phase of your RSA. So remember we had roadway safety audit that you can do through planning, your preliminary design, final design, construction, work zones prior to the project opening to traffic. Also, we talked about intersections and existing roadways. And finally, there's a prompt list for um, uh, land development, land development RSAs. So here are this prompt list for, for uh, the planning stage audit. So if you're doing an RSA during the planning stage, here are some of the things you might wanna consider. So as we, as we read across through this uh, prompt list, we might look at the general topics. We might say, okay, the, the type and degree of access to property and developments, that's number two under general topics. So some of the design issues we might want to talk about or a, a look, be on the lookout for would be the route choice. How does that impact safety? Um, the impact of continuity with existing network, if it's a brand new roadway. What are the design standards, those broad design standards? Do they incorporate safety? We want to talk about design speed, look at volume and traffic characteristics. How about right away? You know, do we need to address right away? Do we need to acquire some right away to help us with our safety improvement? And what is the combination of safety features that we can look at? Uh, and then if we're is that uh, design issues, if we're looking at intersections specifically, you can see the lists there that would prompt you to look at certain things. If you're out on doing work on interchanges, there's a list of things that you could you could take a look at. And also some environmental constraints. You know, some of the things are we looking at uh, 
the surrounding terrain from an environmental standpoint, what, what are the constraints that will allow us to do things, uh, weather or noise barriers. Somebody brought up earlier animals, animal fencing, crossings, and so on. So you can see this prompt list works, I think, rather well to just kind of get the juices flowing and kind of helps the team think about those things to, to think about on safety. And of course, there'll be other things. So the second prompt list is the preliminary design stage audit. And it, and it follows the same kind of logic. There's more topics because more is being known. As the project is being designed, if you're at a 30% point of the design, you're gonna know more about drainage, landscaping, adjacent developments, access for emergency vehicles, some of the maintenance issues. And I liked the, uh, uh, I think it came from team standpoint about the snow, stacking of snow. I think a lot of people miss that in operations. It is certainly a safety concern. Uh, RSA can bring that forward. I really like that, by the way. Uh, human factors and changes since the, since the previous audit, if you've done a previous audit. And so there's a prompt list number three for a final design stage audit. Again, the general topics do change because more is now known about your design. And so you can go down the list and you can look at alignment details, design issues. If you're dealing with interchanges, here are some of the things that you might want to look at to help you think about safety. Uh, you're going to know a lot about the roadside uh, the over to the left of the, or I'm sorry, the right of the list, you know, poles and obstructions what your roadside barriers are gonna start looking like, pedestrian railing and so on. Uh, as we go down, you'll see there's a prompt list for work zone traffic control. And again, the road classification, the environment, you can look at the list on the left-hand side and start looking at each one of these categories and asking yourself the question, do we have a safety concern with those? So I'll just kind of leave this with you. It should be a handout that you receive as part of today's workshop. There's the pre-opening stage audit. And by the way, I don't see very many RSAs that are ever done with a pre-opening stage audit of, of a roadway. It's all been built. And before you open it to traffic, if you don't do an audit, you can. Not very many people do. Uh, here's one. This is the long list. This is prompt list six, which is one of two existing road audit. And so you're looking at existing roadways and existing intersections. And so again, the list becomes quite long, but yet the team can ponder all of this when they get into their pre-audit meeting, take this list out with you in the field when you're out there tromping the earth in step four, uh, when you look at the project, and also when you come back and do the audit analysis in step five and you start writing your report. These are just a great refresher, so it helps you not miss things. And there's page two of prompt list six, the existing road audit. There's, there's quite a bit there. And then finally, we do have, although it's kind of a short one, we do have a prompt list for land use development. You know, uh, what's the alignment going to look like? How does that mesh with the existing facilities? What's parking provisions? What's servicing the facilities look like from a maintenance standpoint? Uh, being able to, to get in and out. Um, so some of these things, you know, are just kind of, kind of food for thought. So there it is, the prompt list. I just wanted to, to share that with you. Okay, I'm going to go back to this sharing my presentation. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I should be back on my slide presentation. Okay. So again, there's, I've already covered this. There's the prompt list for each type of project, be it pre-construction, construction, post-construction, post -construction, or, or land development. Um, again, I think I've covered some of this, but we'll touch upon it real briefly. When you're looking at the project data and drawings under step three, the pre-audit, when you're out doing the site, it's nice to have those prompt lists in your back pocket. When you're doing the analysis in step five and when you're writing the report in step six, these prompt lists are really handy to have, and they're just really great reminders. I find them very, very useful and very beneficial. We've already reviewed the prompt lists, so I won't go through that. So I want to kind of get into, as we're kind of getting, getting towards the finish here, I want to kind of do some case studies. And if we were in an ideal situation, if we were all together, one happy group of individuals, we would probably take a break, maybe eat a little bit of lunch, and go actually out into the field and actually do a mini RSA, actually kind of prompt, 
you know, tromp around through the field. And what I would put together is I would probably put together the scope already, and I'd already put together a lot of the, the pre-audit meeting, and we'd kind of go through a mock-up of the pre-audit meeting. But then we'd also go out into the field, make notes, you know, spend about an hour doing that, come back and practice what, you know, doing an, a post-audit or, or post-field analysis or audit analysis, what that might start to look like, and we might start to just write the outline of the report. But since we're not all here together today, I'm going to try to do this in a virtual environment. So here we go. In the following slides, what improvements could be made? So let's go to a chat room. Let's get into our groups to discuss. In the following slide, what would you identify as safety issues if you were conducting an RSA on the portion of the roadway? Here's the roadway that we're doing the audit on. Can everybody see that roadway? Yes? Okay. So, Don. Yes. I'm just going to give them a second to check out the picture because they won't be able to see it when they're in the group session. Okay. All right. So, everybody take a look. And our question is in the following slide, well, in this slide, what would you identify as a safety issue if you were conducting an RSA on this portion of the roadway? So, everybody take a good look while we break out into our sessions. So, um, I think for the next two ones, we're actually going to stay as a larger group and we'll go through the slides. That way we can see the picture the whole time. Um, but we would love to hear um, what you guys kind of got out of this. Um, Brent, can you pull up the picture again and share your screen? Yes. Uh -huh. I will share the screen. Let's see. Hey, can you see the picture? Yes. Yes. So let's start um, out of order so that Savannah and Shannon don't tell all the answers before anybody else can. <laughs> Yay! Hey, that was nice that way. Yeah, so how about City of Sandpoint or Independent, somebody from that group? All right, well, what we've kind of noticed on it, you know, is there's, there's really no shoulder there. The slope's kind of steep, and the uh, telephone poles, they look real close to the edge of the road there. You know, and then the picture went away kind of quick before we all got a real good look at it. But looking at it too, you know, guys were saying they didn't think that there was any uh, fog line, you know, the white line on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. So those would be our safety concerns with that roadway. Thank you very much. Um, so let's go with breakout room three with Art, Brian, Tanya, somebody from that group. Okay, so uh, Sandpoint discussed pretty much what we had discussed. Um, if that stop sign is facing our way, there, there could be some um, like stop sign ahead sign or some kind of advance warning for the zone ahead. But the clearance zone on the side on the shoulder was already discussed in that power pole. So that would be the only thing that we would have to add to it. Uh, breakout room number one. Uh, with Julie and Sayonara. Well, Ju Julie uh, had a really good idea. She thought that post next to the uh, power line was maybe a cross. So we suggested they update their roadside <laughs> memorial policy because that's, that's a fairly dangerous road the way it's designed, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, I, and, I, oh. Go ahead. Oh, and then maybe putting some reflectors on those. Power post. Yeah. We had oh, talked about I'm maybe. Sorry, I was kicked out and you know accepted back in a couple of times. So I hope this session is really recorded. So the only thing I would have to add, I know that on a lot of state highways, the those posts are in a clear zone, but everything else has to be a breakaway. Yeah, we talked about uh, and breakaway power poles. <laughs> I, I coming, back to, <laughs> coming back to the being kicked out and so I missed out a lot so hopefully this is recorded right this, this will be recorded and sent out to everybody okay sorry for repetition no you're fine um, did we have anything else from uh, Savannah's group uh, yeah a couple things so Along with the shoulder, you know, depending on the length of this road and how, um, where the last stop sign was, if there's no shoulder, there's probably 
a lot of cases of runoff, road type of accidents. Uh, you don't have any rumble strips if it's late at night. There, you know, there's going to be some issues there. Um, we'd look at the retro reflectivity of the stop sign um, because, again, at nighttime you may not see that sign if it's not reflecting properly. Um, another thing, without the shoulder, one of the things you would have to consider is how are um, bicyclists and pedestrians dealing with this. Um, road here. It looks like there's a small fence also like beyond the power poles and so you might have some issues when you're plowing and you know where that snow goes, does it hold it back. Um, and I think, oh, there might be some speed issues here too. We don't know what the speed limit is and, and whatnot, but there might be some speed issues and certainly people blowing through the intersections. Hey, great. I mean, those are all really, really great comments. And you can see that some of the some of the, the solutions can range from some very simple low cost. Be, it would be helpful. It's not the ideal solution, such as delineation for the pole, maybe a little bit of simple guardrail or so on. Clear to the more expensive solutions of I assume the fence line might be the right of way line. So if you're going to flatten the slope, you'd have to require some right of way. And then certainly moving moving power poles can be expensive. I, I've got to tell, I've got to just briefly tell my power pole story. Okay, so 1985, young Brent goes to work at ITD. He's begging to get a project. The project is assigned to him in downtown Boise, and it's removing a lot of trees down on 15th, 15th and River, that little wow down there. Uh, and I can't get the utilities to respond. Idaho Power cannot respond to move the power poles. Mind you, this is before the days of the cell phone. And so I had kind of become frustrated and the contractor was sawing down these big trees and I called Idaho Power and I says, the contractor's really angry. I think he's starting to saw down your power poles and I held the receiver outside of the phone booth. And the Idaho Power ran down there really fast and then they got really, really angry with me because I kind of fibbed. But it got them there and going. But the problem, the story didn't end just there. I, the next day I was called into the district engineer's office and the district engineers do a lot of clout and got chewed out. And he said, if you ever do something like this again, your job could be in jeopardy. But as I exited the door, he stopped me and he said, he smiled and he says, but you do get an A for innovation. So anyway, we all kind of learned on that. So anyway, days before the cell phone. Okay, let's go on to our next one. I Okay, so we're not gonna do breakout sessions. Don had a really, really, really great idea that we're gonna look at this next picture kind of as a group, kind of the same song, you know, what are some of the things that might leap out at you if you were out there doing an initial RSA? Some of the things that, that, that you would want to try to capture and maybe start uh, looking at doing in a report. So can everybody see this picture? <laughs> hey, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give everybody a couple of minutes and Don will help me lead the conversation, but uh, just take a few minutes. And then we'll let people, we might, you know, kind of stay a little bit within your kind of groups, but we'll just kind of chime in and see what we come up with. We need Julie and her, uh, her music, her Jeopardy music. Oh, yeah, I didn't pull it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a few bars. Oh, you don't want that. <laughs> Trust me. So being as you said Jeopardy, Brett, are you related to Ken? <laughs> Am I related to who? Ken Jennings, the world champion Jeopardy player. <laughs> I, I wish. <laughs> I, think, I hope he's got his money still. But no, no, no. I come from a family of people who are, tend to be underachievers. So. <laughs> I can tell we're getting to the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay, trying, this, she's trying to find that music for us. Okay, well, we have one more slide after this one, but let's go ahead and get started. Let's, is there mm -hmm. anybody here who wants to kind of jump on board and, and kind of maybe start some of the issues and then others can chime in? Signage, bad signage. <laughs> yeah, a little retro reflectivity issue there on yeah. the right. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like that stop ahead sign is probably on uh, maybe the wrong side of the road. Straight yeah. across from the stop sign. 
All right. Yep. So yeah. it's kind of hard to see. A little Looks hard like to there's see. two stop signs up there by those headlights, but the headlights are coming at you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, they were consistent anyway. That <laughs> makes you wonder. Okay. You need some striping or delineators. Yeah, okay. definitely. I think that's a good point. I think the thing that kind of pops into everybody's head is where in the hell is the road? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Anything else? Yeah. So it, it looks as if there is snow on the road. If so, snow removal lighting was one of the comments. Yep, could be. Mm -hmm. Spot for school class. And I, and I think it kind of illustrates, too, the importance of going out and looking at the roadway at night because during the day, we might not be picking up on reflectivity. We might have pavement markings that are there, but they have absolutely no reflectivity built into them. And it is kind of a head scratcher as far as the two stop aheads and the two stop signs, but yet you have headlights coming at you. So it might be that this is a one-way road up to the stop signs, but then it's a two-way road past the stop signs and the, and the cars at the intersection. I don't know. Oh, so that one stop ahead, I thought that was a stop sign. That's how bad those signs are. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see anything on it. Yeah. So, you know, this, so this would probably be a, a really good project to, to introduce some new, kind of some low cost fixes to improve safety. And, and it could be there's some liability if we don't fix these signs. Maybe if a crash occurs, then lawyers love to flip over all the rocks and, and come come at you with all kinds of stuff and they would certainly want to talk about this. Anything else while we've got this here? Yeah, all good, all good things. And again, it's, I think it's trying to point out that even though you go do look at these during the day, looking at them at night is also a, a big benefit. Okay, so we have one more, one last one here we want to look at. So again, look at this, take a few minutes to look at it and we'll open it up for a little general discussion. Bridge. <laughs> there you go. Julie's on top of it. All right, time's up. I can almost see Alex. I could see almost see Alex Trebek peeking around one of the apartments there. So anyway, what do you think? Let's open it up. Bridge. <laughs> need a new bridge. <laughs> yeah, need a new bridge. But let's just assume for a moment that uh, the bridge has a pretty good load rating. You know, it's an old, it's uh, it's older, but it's one of those old stout dudes, and you know the sufficiency rating's okay, and it's carrying the traffic, and it's not weight restricted. Uh, so it kind of gets expensive for a place. So maybe the decision is the bridge is here to stay. But what can we do to help safety? Maybe some more signage to let you know it's a narrow bridge. Okay. If there is Perhaps some crash cushions or something there for those abutments. No, absolutely. Hit that abutment at 60 miles an hour. Do you think the bridge is just going to give way? I don't think so. They built them stout back in the 30s and 40s, early 50s. Well, it's definitely not pedestrian friendly. Nope. There you go. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was why I said you needed a new one. <laughs> there you go, and and it may very well be that yeah, if you're if you're doing a a new one or if you're you know maybe taking care of one side, you can see you've got a big shoulder coming into it, where you and might you have at, pedestrians and bicyclists, but then it narrows down to that much. Yeah, you look at all the traffic coming the other way, and uh, you know, one of these days a pedestrian or bicyclist is going to wind up underneath one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Anybody spots there? Well, that cross street's awfully close, close to the bridge. Yeah, there's an approach there. What's up with that? <laughs> the good old days. 
<laughs> good old days, you know. So, so if we're going to put, say, a crash cushion or a, or a guardrail system, you know, we might be faced with maybe trying to relocate this approach, just depending upon what the approach does. Does it take people down to the to the river or stream, or does it take it onto somebody else's property or house? So, you know, we just maybe don't know, but we probably have to do something with that approach. Anything else? Okay, I mean, those are all good things. And so you can see just by looking at things even quickly in a picture, you can kind of start formulating your thoughts and ideas. If you've got a prompt list along with you, that will, will help you as well. So anyway, just trying to give you a flavor of what the field studies might look like. Again, it's too bad we can't go out and actually kind of do a little exercise out in the field. So as we kind of start to close down here today, we're at the top of the hour, but if you can bear with me for just another five minutes, I think we'll get to the finish line. Um, when we start writing the audit reports, I just wanted to leave this format with you. I really like this format and these sample pages of a, of a post-construction audit report, the safety issues, uh, including the nature of the issues and how they contribute to the collisions are summarized in a graphic on the left. So rather than have a page just full of text, we have a nice picture and we have text boxes that summarize what the concerns and the issues are. And then the picture on the right then offers the suggestions of how the issues can be addressed and are summarized in the graphic. So the graphic on the right says, maybe here's some of the solutions and you use text boxes and little arrows to try to try to point to that. And so when you look at the intersection, you can see kind of a regular old plain intersection, but we maybe have some real turning movement issues with rear end collisions and turning movement collisions. And you can see some proposed designs there with some, uh, with some turn lanes and maybe some other features as well. Anyway, I like, the, I like the way this is done because you're not consuming just lots of pages of text that people have a hard time reading. Anytime that you can use graphics to describe the problem and graphics to, to describe maybe what some of the proposed thoughts or, or general solutions might be, that'd be fine. And again, the designers then take it from there and maybe would do detailed design. <sighs> We talked just a little bit about liability and it's kind of, words are important, words matter. And so it's important that when we, when we put together our, our list of priorities, we might uncover some things that really need to be done, but we just don't have the budget. So here's kind of an example. If we look at this intersection, which is not the greatest intersection on planet earth, it's very skewed. If we were to respond that we will not align the intersection at Jefferson, road we do not feel that is needed it's not a very good response okay people might pick that up you might introduce a little bit of liability say well, why not if it's really important somebody's going to get killed you knew all about it but you did nothing about it you might consider a response written around while we agree that the need to align the skewed intersection the realignment cannot be achieved within the existing right of way so we're given reasons as to why Realignment will require the purchase of property at a cost of about half a million, representing about 15% of the total annual transportation budget. The acquisition of the required property may be considered in future budgets. And so that's a, that's a much better response because you're given some why. And also, if, if, if you're out there and there's a, some concern there, you might want to have a little bit of help as far as writing some of these responses. So you can kind of see the difference between saying, well, hey, we know about it, but we're not going to do anything about it, too bad, versus we know about it, we're concerned about it, we want to do something about it, we can't right now, and here we need this one, okay? Just a little example for that. So when, when you're writing these things, it's words really matter. We have reviewed the prompt lists. I'm not going to go over those again. We have reviewed the RSA groups and phases to where we've got it just burned into our brain with um, pre-construction, construction, post-construction, post and land development. We know the steps. I shared with you a little, little handout there that we ran you steps one through eight. So you've got that handout available to kind of refresh. And you also have this presentation and recording so you can go back down through those steps when you bake your cake. Here's some reference information. Uh, I think this is good information. Uh, the FHWA guide that's there was put out uh, some time ago by Federal Highways. It's very readable. Matter of fact, I took information from that guide in today's workshop as well. Uh, also, ITD did have a man 
Nihon Roadway Safety Audits. I don't know what the status of that manual is. We created that when I was at ITD. However, there's the name Kelly Campbell, and Kelly works in the Office of Highway Safety at ITD. Got her phone number. She knows I'm putting this on the screen. Kelly is a very good resource for data and safety data, and she's very happy to talk to you about safety data. She's very, very approachable, and you would enjoy, if you've dealt with Kelly, I'm sure you've enjoyed dealing with her. Also, LTAC is available. You can you know, contact the LTAC and the LTAC safety team at any time and they will help you as well. So I want to talk just now real briefly before we close out about LTAC's local highway safety improvement program. Uh, there's a brochure that's out there and I'll probably ask Dawn at the end here to maybe see if we can't find this or show you where you can find this. And the brochure that describes the LSIP program talks about the timeline for applying for funds, the data requirements that are, that, are, that are required for applying, and that there's also funding available within the LSIP program to Look. do roadway safety audits. So if you're having trouble funding a roadway safety audit, there may be some funds available there. So I would encourage you to go ahead and, and, and get a copy of that brochure. Um, it talks about completing the application for the program. Typically, the applications are available online about September, so you've got between now and September to think about your safety needs. Again, uh, data makes the world go round, so you'll find as you go through the application process, for those of you who have not done this, that you really need to address uh, data. Perhaps you've got an opportunity to do a simple roadway safety audit between now and the application, and if you have a roadway safety audit done, go with your application that might help your help your application process uh, funds can be used for design and construction so that's kind of nice um, it, funds are now available for minimal right-of-way acquisition where funds used to not be available for minimal right-of-way acquisition so that's kind of a nice feature as well so I'll leave that for you to kind of kind of chat with uh, with LTAC on Kevin Cuther is the contact person at LTAC again I, I might have Don expand just a bit further you can find this on LTAC's website. So have you or your agency participated or done any projects through L, L, the LSIP program with LTAC? If you haven't you may want to consider doing doing so and again I'll leave you to talk with LTAC about that. I'm That's not out in my wheelhouse but I just wanted to, to, to kind of leave you with that. There is my contact information. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit more about the roadway safety audit process, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, if there's questions regarding the LSIP program or how LTAC works, I'm going to get to LTAC. That's out of my wheelhouse. Uh, but if you want to talk in just generalities or if you have questions about the workshop and the roadway safety audit process itself, um, I would certainly be happy to have a brief conversation with you. Either. 